So my name is Harriet Sugarman, and I'm the Executive Director of Climate Mama, and I am um, really pleased to have the honor uh, to introduce both um, our special guest tonight, uh, who's here for the Festival of Conscience and the talk back uh, for this evening's performance, Dr. Jennifer Francis, who was one of the inspirations for the show this evening, um, an Arctic scientist, and I am going to read uh, her bio to you and also at Climate Mama, we have three mantras uh, that we teach and talk to our um, community about, and that is to tell the truth, and that actions speak louder than words, and that we shouldn't be afraid. And I think that all of those things were things that we learned here today, and um, it gives us strength and gives us courage to move forward when we see what these climate scientists uh, have to go through. And Karen, in her letter to the audience, and I don't know if you had a chance to read that in the program, said that she uh, wrote this play because she was moved by the commitment of climate scientists to tell the truth, even in the face of relentless, personal, malicious, well-founded, and factual false assaults. Um, and this speaks directly to me, and I think to many of us here. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, Karen, and you want to come sit up here, and uh, Jennifer as well, Dr. Francis. So Karen uh, Melipede is the playwright and director of Extreme Weather, and she's also the author of 17 plays. She's directed premieres of nine of them. Her most recent is a post-9-11 trilogy, and I'd like to read you just a short list of some of the plays that she's written. One is called Another Life, which is a surreal telling of U.S. torture program. One is Prophecy, about the cost of war to veterans and those who love them. One is called Iraq, speaking of war, which is a docudrama. I Will Bear Witness, which is a Holocaust uh, diary. The Beekeeper's Daughter, the healing of a refugee from the Bosnian War. Better People, which is about genetic engineering and us about domestic violence. Uh, Karen teaches social justice at, at the thea um, and theater at John Jay College. And she also works with the new John Jay Environmental Justice and Sustainability Program, which we at Climate Mama and the Mothers Project recently teamed up with and had the honor of presenting an educational forum called Today's Fossil Fuels and the Future of Our Children's Health. And she's also the co-founder of uh, the Theater 3 Collaborative, where we are. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Francis, she conducts leading edge research on extreme weather events and their links to the rapidly warming and melting Arctic. Her evidence and that of other researchers suggests that Arctic warming is causing weather patterns to become more persistent, which can lead to extreme, uh, extremes such as drought, cold spells, heat waves, and flooding events. Dr. Francis earned a BS in meteorology from San Jose State and a PhD in atmospheric scientist from the University of Washington. Uh, she uh, is a professor at Rutgers where she's taught courses in satellite and remote imaging and uh, on climate change. She's a researcher and a professor with the Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences, uh, uh, Science, Sciences at Rutgers um, and studies Arctic climate change and Arctic global warming linkages with more than 40 peer-reviewed publications on these topics. She's also the co-founder and co-directed the Rutgers Climate and Environmental Institute and um, in her bio she also uh, tells us that she spent 13 months traveling um, through Central America on a sailboat with her children and her husband and that she and her husband also circum uh, navigated the world in a sailboat from 1980 to 1985 including Cape Horn and the Arctic and that is where she first uh, became interested, I believe, in studying the Arctic and climate ice. So I'm going to leave it to them um, and to all of you. We have a unique opportunity in this very intimate setting to be able to ask them questions and learn more about uh, why we're here and what we need to do to help us tell the truth. Hello, um, everyone. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say how I met uh, Jennifer, which was just phoning her up uh, uh, because I was researching the play, and I had read some. I had read about her research, and I needed to use it for the play, so I just dialed the phone, and this lovely woman answered the phone, and we talked for about I don't know 20 minutes or so, and we we just she told me you know she said call back, and and I did, and and uh, I w I was uh, you know. That's one reason that, that the play got written because I, I uh, found her research and and uh, had this uh, immediate uh, warmth connection from her uh, to me. 
uh, out of the blue. So thank you very much for that. You're part of the uh, <laughs> the core of the, of this play. Well, I just want to add a little more to that because I, I looked back through my zillions of emails to <laughs> try to find the first one I had uh -huh. with you. Uh, it was two and a half years ago. I got an email, yeah. as Karen said, completely out of the blue. And I get a lot of emails out of the <laughs> blue from people, um, especially since I've gone down this research path um, linking Arctic change to weather patterns um, and being much more sort of in the public eye than I ever was before. Um, so, you know, I read this email from Karen and I was like, hmm, a play about climate change and extreme weather and I don't know, this sounds a little <laughs> out there. Um, but I, I read it closely, I looked at some of the um, links that she'd sent me about her previous work and clearly she was very serious and she had done her homework. And I think that comes through very strongly in this play because a lot of what you heard tonight, which I don't know about you, but I am absolutely exhausted. <laughs> yeah, right. You've been through it. <laughs> um, Again. So much of it is true. Yeah. Um, and the complexity of these many aspects of the climate system and people and energy and politics mm -hmm. and the ecosystem and all of these very complex parts of our society that she wove together in this play in just, I thought, a masterful way. Mm. Um, but there is a lot of truth to it, and that's because she did her homework so well. Um, it's, it's just a very impressive play, and I just wish the audience were 50 times bigger. We and do too. I just we want to too. thank you all for coming and being so interested um, for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is a very important message mm -hmm. that Karen is, is bringing to the public in a way that I think um, will reach many people. I mean, as, as, it, as you heard in the play, it's hard sometimes for scientists to, to connect with the public. Um, you know, some people obviously get it, but some people just don't. And so this is a venue and a and a way of communication that I think is extremely important because this message is extremely important. And we've got to just try every way we can. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think we formed such a bond mm -hmm. so quickly through our phone calls. And then I came down here about a year ago, yeah, I think, for yeah. an, an early reading of the play. And I must say it's improved. <laughs> it was great yeah. then, but it was even yeah. better yeah. tonight. Yeah. And, um, I just want to thank you, Karen, for doing this amazing work. Thank so you. Let's yes. And the, the commercial really is, we only have three more weeks of this run. Uh, please tell your friends. The best, uh, the best advertising for us is word of mouth. Um, so if you have people you can email and say get down here, uh, students you know, whatever, um, just uh, tell your friends about the play. We really want it to go on. We're trying to raise more money. We're trying to reach out to people. If you know anybody who has money who wants to be a theater producer, it's a lot of fun. Uh, they can join us in this effort. Um, we believe in the play. We're, we're very grateful for Jennifer's belief and Jim Hansen's belief, two major climate scientists who were in from the beginning helping me with the research. I was, you know, at, telling me, you know, sort of checking my, my facts and figures and making sure I was on the right course, but also two people who have actually been attacked uh, by email, phone calls, letters, articles, uh, been vilified for the for telling the truth, essentially, for research that, that they have done. And, and the, as an artist, I identified with that because artists get attacked a lot uh, for telling the truth. But I also felt that the scientists, it's not, the scientists are, are not only telling the truth, they're telling us that we're in danger. Um, and it's not even like Galileo, because in a way, you know, I just read today that 33% of Americans don't know whether the Earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the Earth, right? It doesn't really matter very much because the, the, the sun and the earth are taking care of it by themselves. But it really does matter when we start uh, interfering with the climate, which we've done. And, and so this is a new moment, I think, in human history that we are in together. 
And somehow, uh, if we're going to keep this beautiful world um, alive, we have to uh, understand our place in the scheme of things and change the way we're living. Uh, and probably all of you in this audience know that. Um, but it's, it, it seems that we're in a we're in what they call the anthropomorphine, anthropo, how do you say? Anthropocene. Anthropocene, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is the man-made climate. This has never happened before. Uh, and so we have a, an, an enormous responsibility, I think not just to ourselves, but to the animals and the ice and the plants who uh, would really do quite well without us uh, if we weren't here destroying their habitats. So we have to, this is a time to really grow up in a major way. And we'd, I think either any of us, either of us would be happy to answer questions. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. So if what, um, what I understand from the science that you're, you know, you're, you're talking about is that if the Arctic is melting, and, and what can it's you no do? If. <laughs> right, so it's no if. It is melting. So, so how are, what can we really do? I mean, is it too late? Mm. It's never too late to slow it down. It's too late to stop it. Mm -hmm. But whatever we can get going on doing now will make the impacts less than they would be if we kept on doing business as usual, which is the path we're on right now. So we are going to see the ice disappear, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not 2016, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. probably within the next 20 to 40 years, mm -hmm. I'd say is the best estimate that most scientists are sort of mm -hmm. homing in on. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be a lot of impacts in terms of sea level rise. I mean, that we, we put a lot of balls in motion that we can't stop because mm -hmm. carbon dioxide lasts a very long time in the atmosphere, a hundred or more years. And so all of this carbon dioxide we've already put into the atmosphere is going to be there for a long time. It's going to continue to trap heat um, the way greenhouse gases do. And so we're already baked in for mm. a certain amount of change, but we've got to slow it down, and, and it's within our power to do that. It is happening. I, mean, I get very encouraged, mm. actually, to see and hear reports from various countries around the world who are really making a big change in their energy economy in terms of developing renewable um, solar, wind, you know, a lot of research on various other ways of, of getting energy that doesn't involve fossil fuels. Um, and also potentially extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I mean, geoengineering was touched on in the play, um, and most of it, I would say, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, except for the mm. possibility of actually extracting and sequestering carbon dioxide mm -hmm. from the atmosphere yeah. and changing it to a solid that can be buried. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it's not too late. I mean, even since I wrote the play, renewable energy technology has has rushed ahead, mm -hmm. and there are papers, there are studies, and it's true that you know other countries are way ahead of us um, that we could power the entire world on renewable energy. Uh, it's possible to do, and conservation too. Yeah, is, um, yeah, is the best form of renewable energy because an electron you don't use is actually saves more than one. It saves several because it takes a lot of energy to create energy. Any other questions? Can you tell us a little bit more about your research with the jet stream and explain that? Sure. So um, this is a very new um, avenue of my research that I've been on just for the last couple of years. I mean, literally, um, the first paper we wrote was a little over two years mm -hmm. ago. And uh, my colleague Stephen Vavris at the University of Wisconsin and I um, really realized that I mean, I've been studying the Arctic my whole career and, and studying why the ice was, was disappearing. I mean, that may sound silly because, oh, it's getting warmer, of course the ice is going to melt. But actually there are many factors involved that have caused the ice to melt. There's the effects of clouds and the effects of moisture in the atmosphere and, and changes in ocean currents. There's a lot of things that go into it. But once the ice really started to disappear, which is right about when I left graduate school, was when we really started to notice something very odd was happening in the mm -hmm. Arctic. Um, just recently, I decided, I, I started thinking, you know, it was actually on that sailing trip with my children when I 
had some time to kind of gaze out at the horizon and step back from my everyday research and think about the bigger implications mm -hmm. of what was happening in the Arctic. And with my background in meteorology, I realized that as the Arctic is warming so much faster than everywhere else on the planet, in fact, it's warming two to three times faster than, mm -hmm. say, here in New York, um, that has a, a big effect on the, the way weather patterns work. The reason is because it's that difference in temperature between the Arctic, which is cold, and down here farther south, which is warm. When that, t when that temperature difference is large, that is the fuel behind this jet stream mm. thing, which mm. is this fast moving river of air high over our heads. The jet stream is what creates the weather that we feel down here on the surface. It's, it not only separates the cold air to the north from the warm air to the south, but it also takes a wavy path as it travels around the northern hemisphere. So these waves go north and south. You've probably seen them on a TV weather map. And when, so going back to the Arctic warming so fast, so if the Arctic is warming really fast, that means that differences in temperature between the Arctic and the areas farther south is getting smaller. So that fuel that's driving the jet stream is getting weaker. Mm. And that means the winds in the jet stream are getting weaker. This is something that we've actually been able to measure. And we know that when those winds get weaker, those waves that it takes around the northern hemisphere actually get larger. A great way to think of this is you can think of a river of water running down a steep hill. When that hill is steep, that water tends to go fast and it tends to go pretty straight. But when that same river gets out to the coastal plain where there's a very shallow slope to the land, you've all seen it from airplanes probably, though you see these rivers take these big meandering paths. Well, that's the kind of thing that happens in the jet stream. It's much more easily deflected by a mountain range or, or by a bubble of hot air over mm -hmm. a continent. So what we're seeing then is, and what we're, our, my hypothesis is, that as the Arctic continues to warm so fast, these waves in the jet stream are getting larger and these wavy patterns are becoming more frequent. So what does that matter? Well, when those waves get large, the waves move more slowly from west to east. And those waves are what create the weather that we feel here on the ground. So they create the storms, they create the high pressure like today. And so the result is then, our hypothesis anyway, is that our weather will become more persistent or like you heard in the play the weather patterns tend to get stuck so think of what's going on in california mm -hmm. right now they've been in this amazingly stuck weather mm -hmm. pattern ever since december mm -hmm. in fact it's been called the ridiculously resilient ridge mm -hmm. which means a ridge is when the jet stream takes a big northward mm -hmm. swing okay so this ridge has been basically sitting there since last december so I can't say this is because of the Arctic warming so fast, but this is the, exactly the kind of pattern that we expect to see more often mm. as the Arctic continues mm -hmm. to warm as a result of the globe warming overall, which is of course back to the fossil fuels. So it's a long story, but um, that's what we think is going on. We have more and more evidence all the time that this is really happening. Um, but as you can imagine, because the atmosphere is such a complicated thing, it's hard, to, it's hard to detect statistically these changes in a very noisy thing. So this is what we're up against right now in our research, but um, it's, from a science perspective, it's very exciting because it's, it's such an important change that's gonna affect billions of people. But on the other hand, it's not a happy, not a happy outcome. Oliver? I wanted to ask him, what do you think of John's uh, solution, that is to say the carbon tax? Well, there are many forms of carbon tax or carbon fees or, or ways to price carbon um, that have been proposed. Um, I think it makes sense to charge the proper amount of, of money for what it really costs to produce and to protect the fossil fuels that we've been enjoying all these years. And when I say protect, that includes stabilizing the Middle East and all of those mm -hmm. sorts of hidden costs that don't normally get included in mm -hmm. 
uh, the price of what we pay for gasoline and, and heating. So I think it makes sense to charge the proper amount somehow or other for fossil fuels because when that happens, we're going to see that they're a lot more expensive and we know that whenever uh, energy becomes more expensive, people conserve it, which makes a lot of sense because it saves a lot of money for your individual wallets. And it'll also have the effect of making renewable energy resources more competitive. So somehow or other, it needs to happen. I'm not an expert on the econ economics of how that should happen, but I do think it does, it should happen. Uh, yes, back in the back. No, not longer summers and longer winters. What I'm trying to explain is you'll be in a particular weather pattern for a long time. So for example, this past winter, you remember maybe it was very cold in the eastern two-thirds of the country for a good month and a half. So that was a pretty unusual weather pattern. People are already starting to study it. And that goes hand in hand with the, the drought and heat waves that California's been experiencing because what's been happening is that the jet stream has been in this big ridge over the western mm. part of the country and a big southward dip over the east. Mm. And so these things go hand in hand. So the idea is that you'll get in a particular weather pattern and it'll just hang around a lot longer than it used to. Mm. And we're starting to see evidence for these very wavy patterns in the jet stream to be happening more often. So that's that's what we expect to see. So not a longer summer per se, but, but whatever pattern you're in tends to last longer. In the southern hemisphere, and I don't know the science behind this, but I know that the, 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 there's, there are already uh, many countries in Africa where, where and in Syria, the, the Syrian civil war was started because of climate change, because there was a drought in Syria that drove people off the land into the cities and there was no social support from the uh, uh, Assad regime for, for the people who were displaced and without, without livelihoods. And that began the, what, what started as a movement, uh, a social liberation movement. Um, and turned into this brutal civil war. But also in Africa, there are many countries where the, the food patterns, the food growing is, t is totally out of whack and people are now vastly food insecure because of these weather patterns in the south. But what struck me about Jennifer's work and the importance of it is that the northern hemisphere is the wealthy hemisphere and the northern hemisphere is the hemisphere that is mostly responsible for polluting uh, the most. And so if we begin to suffer, maybe we will do something about it. That was, <laughs> that was the thought. And, and among the things we can do are our carbon <coughs> tax. We can also divest from carbon fuel. And then they start calling that stranded assets. I mean, carbon uh, energy companies pay big dividends because they don't pay their fair share of the damage that they do. And they get all these tax breaks. And so they're good investments for pension funds and, you know, um, and if that could change and people could start pulling their money individually and collectively out of fossil fuels, that's another, I think, powerful uh, tool to, to level the playing field because the renewables can come in and, and uh, fill, that, fill that gap. But there's lots of, contra I mean, there are many discussions going on about this. What are the, you know, what are the best ways to, uh, to work this change? Well, there's a couple things that I wanted to mention there. Um, 
So where I've been taking flack, if you will, is basically related to this idea that um, we came out with this hypothesis, we had some evidence that supported it, we wrote this paper two and a half years ago, and it was picked up by the media like it was the truth and it was a, you know, a fact. And um, even to the point where the president's science advisor got a hold of me and wanted to find out, you know, what I was working on and, you know, what knew I had to tell him about because he wanted to go tell the president about this work. And it was all at the time when the polar vortex had attacked um, the eastern mm -hmm. part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and everybody was whining loudly. <laughs> and so he went and made this uh, short video. I mean, some of you might have seen mm -hmm. it, um, mm -hmm. John Holdren. Uh, and this started an uproar in my scientific community because it was, I mean, he was very careful in his words in saying that, you know, this is a hypothesis that, you know, this polar vortex is in fact um, related to climate change. But so where my colleagues lost it was because this really was a very new idea. It hadn't been completely vetted. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's where I've been getting a lot of flack. Mm -hmm. And it goes on. Um, but in terms of st the students, I think um, they are still very methodical and our science is still very methodical and they're being taught that they still have to be methodical. But this is a really important problem and so, you know, be methodical but get going, <laughs> you know, hurry up, we need answers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some ways, as I said, it's an exciting time to be a scientist studying these problems because they are so important and they are already having potentially huge impacts on, on our society and our country and our economy. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough situation. We've got a, it's a very complex system, as you heard tonight, and uh, it, it make, it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So, I hope that helps. Yeah. So, first I want to say that this drumming was fast and ominous. <laughs> I know, I know. It should not have happened. I apologize for it. I don't know why they are going on. Yeah, it's terrible. It's I, yeah. <laughs> The Keystone Pipeline you're talking about, or yes. I mean, there's a lot of other pipelines that they want to no. build, but like that one has a lot of press. <laughs> the one that's, you know, a big it's you know. you know, it's it's more symbolic than anything. I think. I mean, it's not. We're not talking about enough oil to make a difference, really. No, I know. But well, it's just climate. just having one more expensive piece of infrastructure being built to support the fossil fuel foundation of our energy system, I think, is wrong. I mean, ultimately, it's, it's really not going to make a big difference in terms of the climate system or anything else for that matter, but it's a very symbolic thing, mm -hmm. in my view. Yes? I'm, I'm interested in this problem of how art and theater particularly can alter the way people view the problem and mm -hmm. see themselves as Mm -hmm. on this problem. And it, I have a middle school daughter who mm -hmm. reads all these dystopian books, mm -hmm. and there's a weird way that there's a kind of acceptance of a future that is mm -hmm. unbearable. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and then there's also this idea that, oh, it's okay, you don't have any effect, everything will go on and be wonderful. And in the space between that is work like yours, where mm -hmm. you're saying, this is what's happening, this is what's taking us from Eden to dystopia. We can act. And yet, you know, there's only three dozen of us. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of censorship, not only of the science, but also of the art that speaks to the science. Um, we raised the money for this play from individuals, not from foundations. Uh, we did, not because we didn't try foundations. Uh, we're, we are still going to try to raise more money so that we can bring it to a larger audience. Um, we don't know if we'll be successful with that. Uh, the one foundation that says that they fund uh, particularly plays about science 
is the Sloan Foundation, and they are the same foundation that fund uh, Richard Linsden's chair of meteorology at, Har at, at MIT, and he is one of the, he is retired now, he's gone on to a right-wing think tank, but he was one of the major climate deniers in the country. He's, uh, he's the model for Lindsay in the play, and that is a direct quote from him about God controlling the weather. I took that directly from his mouth. So the Sloan Foundation says they fund plays about science. They wouldn't touch this play in a very nasty way, turned it down twice, um, and, and they are actually funding uh, fossil fuel denial. So a lot of that is, is, is going on. Um, also, I think uh, you know, the, the, the way that, that art, I mean, when you talk about dystopian novels, which I frankly don't like, <laughs> you know, because of the, exactly what you said, it's sort of, okay, this is the way the future is going to be, and then we'll all kill each other, we'll eat our meat, and we'll, you know, everything will be, and how exciting that is. Uh, that, that, again, is part of controlling people. Uh, you control, if you control the culture, you control how people imagine and how people think. So the culture is you know, being controlled and it's financial control, what gets published, what's, what gets well reviewed, um, and then what gets pushed. Uh, there's also, I think, in the, I'm sorry to go on just one more thing, I think in the theater we're still in the McCarthy era in the sense that what was told to people because of McCarthyism is that political art is bad art, period, the end. And so often, you know, when you hear oh, this is a political play, which, you know, of course, every good play is, has a world view, <laughs> right? And a world view is what makes a good play. Um, you know, so, so that, that goes on. There's, there's just a lot of this, and, and here we are in this tiny theater with a, with a tiny group of people who somehow haven't drunk the Kool-Aid of the larger culture and have managed to get themselves here. Uh, it's the other guys who haven't drunk yeah. the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and I mean, we, you know, what keeps us going is the belief that, that there, there is an audience, and uh, that's why I keep saying, please tell people, please help us build that audience. That will make a big difference in terms of funding. Um, uh, we are, we went through a whole thing about should we be reviewed or not. Our last play, which was about the U.S. torture program, we did not allow critics in because we didn't feel that any of the theater critics that we knew knew enough about the torture program to comment. Uh, intelligently on a play that, like this play, was based on fact. Uh, it was also a poetic play. This play we decided to allow the critics in and they are going to come, or at least some of them are going to come, and so you can stay tuned and see how that, how that works out for us. But we did that because we thought, after the climate march, surely, <laughs> you know, there is some kind of sense of the importance of this moment that we share, and that this would be a good moment to drop this play hopefully into a larger cultural discussion. Um, yeah. If I could just add one more thing to that. Um, I think one of the things that make this, makes this play so important is that it is realistic. Mm -hmm. And it's not you know, hyperbole, it's not exaggeration, it's not fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I think a lot of people see other documentaries or shows on TV and you know they're not sure what's real and what's not real mm -hmm. and so I think it's important to have more of these kinds of intersections between art and science that do mm -hmm. present real information and not something that's yeah. so out there that you know it doesn't really help <laughs> Well, first of all, the greenhouse effect is natural. It's just that we're adding to it. Right. That's the problem. So we don't want it to go away completely. <laughs> we just want it to go back to the way, you know, a more nat natural okay. cycle. Um, it would take 100 years, probably a little more. It, there is some question whether it can go back to where it was, actually, mm -hmm. because once we've warmed the earth enough and melted <coughs> enough snow and ice, um, it's difficult for it to grow back without going back into an ice age in a natural sort of a way. Mm -hmm. So we probably won't see it going back to the way it was. Yes. Um, unfortunately, 
unfortunately, we had a, a professor up to our community who was actually an extremist. Uh, his name is Dr. Guy McPherson. Which and, end of the extreme? Uh, <laughs> right. That we're, we're done. That, that we're, we're done. cooked. Oh, we're late. cooked. Um, and he talked uh -huh. a lot about you know twenty plus um, positive feedback loops. Mm. And um, you know I didn't know at the time mm -hmm. really what I thought he was more sounding the alarm, but it was too loud of an alarm. And mm -hmm. then what happened in our community mm -hmm. is people just came up got very depressed. Mm -hmm. So it's Turned like, off. how do we, how do we mm -hmm. find this mm -hmm. fine line? Because I'm kind of tired of hope myself, because I, mm -hmm. I don't think we can get apart from tax. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, do you know of scientists that are, that are of that mode, that are even further mm -hmm. in Doomsville? Um, yeah, there are people who are very pessimistic that we can change our behavior sufficiently mm -hmm. to basically bring that trajectory mm -hmm. back down mm -hmm. off of the business as usual one. I'm looking at temperature mm -hmm. going up here. Um, it's hard to say, you know? I think if we um, start experiencing changes that are so expensive and so obvious, mm -hmm. things like, um, you know, Hurricane Sandy was mm -hmm. terrible, but it was a big wake up call and it did a lot of good mm -hmm. actually in terms of people's thinking. Um, sea level rise is going to start to destroy a lot of expensive mm -hmm. property yes. and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, extreme weather, people are starting to realize and notice in their own backyards that things are not the same as they used to be mm -hmm. and you know this whole, that's partly why this whole idea is kind of caught on is because people are, are looking at what's happening and they're going, oh yeah, that makes sense, you know? So I think the conversation is really starting to change um, for a lot of those kinds of reasons. Um, you know, there's drought in California, price of food going up, um, things like wars in various mm -hmm. places over fresh water supplies. I mean, all of these things are gonna just start to become much more conspicuous and more frequent and the connections mm -hmm are going to be more solid back to climate change. So I'm optimistic that the message is going to be, be realized, especially by the next generation. Um, you know, students get it. Yeah. When I talk to groups of students, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we don't want to hear about all this bad stuff that's happening in the climate system. We just want to get going on it. You know, mm -hmm. let's just fix it now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and it's just, uh, you know, this other, group that we're still working on, but um, even they're starting to come around, mm -hmm. I think. Well, great. The discourse has changed from the climate is not changing to exactly. the climate is changing, but it's always changing. Yes. Uh-huh. And that's mm -hmm. a significant move that is problems. problem. It's even past that, I think. People are, I think, as you heard in the play, humans are changing the climate. Mm -hmm. but what are we going to do about it? And you, we don't want to ruin our economy. And that's where the, the mm -hmm. discussion has shifted now is, is how mm -hmm. to deal with it and you know, whether we should drill for oil in the Arctic or not. And um, you know, those are the issues that are starting to be discussed, not so much whether humans are causing the climate system to change. I think that's pretty well mm -hmm. set and settled. Can I just thank you both really for speaking out and for being here and for helping us all, you know, by hearing you and by just stepping out because it is, as your play showed, that it is personal. It becomes mm -hmm. very personal. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to sit back and do research and not to be public about it. And it helps all of us for you to connect the dots, both from an artistic point of view and from uh, a science point of view, for us to have those dots connected and for you to mm -hmm. Take them as the authority to help us in trying to help other people understand it too. So, yeah. so thank you. You're well, very thank welcome. you all for being here.